Welcome to the ClassCast podcast. Recently, I recorded an episode about learning loss. There's also been a lot of discussion about whether or not standardized testing should occur this year, and if so, what's going to happen with the data and how will that affect students, teachers, and schools? We have a lot of questions and a lot of concerns, uh, a lot of which deal with policy and philosophy and all these kinds of things. But in the end, we should remember that the purpose of education is to uplift and empower individuals and the communities in which they live. So whether or not a student takes a test doesn't actually matter. What really matters is, is that student learning? And since we know that there are always at least a few and maybe a lot of students who thrive in the classroom, who learn a ton, but maybe who struggle on the tests, or maybe who do fine on the tests, but could have demonstrated better learning and in a better way. Well, I think it's time that we all start considering what are some of these alternatives. Well, perhaps the best option and something that is also kind of time tested is the idea of portfolios. But now in the 21st century, we need to think about digital portfolios. How can we have students demonstrate their learning and growth through digital portfolios? Well, we need to give teachers the tools necessary so that students can work together online. They can collaborate also so that they can demonstrate and display their learning whether through gallery walk type activities, demonstrations for parents in the community, or just to demonstrate starting point, finish point for a given skill or standard. That tool has arrived. We need to check out Spaces. Spaces is a great new tool to help teachers implement electronic portfolios so that students can demonstrate 21st century learning in a 21st century format. We don't need paper folders. We don't need to hang things on the wall anymore, especially in a situation where so many students are working remotely, some or all of the time. I strongly recommend you check out spacesedu.com to learn more about what spaces can do for you and your students and how we can move beyond these basic discussions about learning loss, about standardized testing, and test scores in general. Portfolios and electronic portfolios are going to be the way of the future, and spaces is leading the way. So again, check out spacesedu.com. Welcome to the ClassCast Podcast. I'm your host, Ryan Tibbins. Today, we'll be speaking with Jennifer Berkshire, one of the authors of a new book, A Wolf at the Schoolhouse Door, The Dismantling of Public Education and the Future of School. I've been uh, in communication with Jennifer and with her co-writer about coming on the podcast to talk about school choice and some of the, the policy and politics behind both that movement and maybe how that will affect public discourse or the function of public schools. So I'm really excited about this conversation. Jennifer, thank you for joining me today. Thanks so much for having me. So we're going to obviously talk about school choice and and some of the content of the book. But of course, um, as I do on most podcasts, we always want to get a little sense of people's sort of background, because in any situation, especially when we're talking about something as contentious as school choice, I think it's really important to sort of clarify the biases early on. And as we said before we started recording, I'm a little on the fence. I see some benefits. I see some drawbacks. And I'm trying to sort this out. So half the podcast is there to you know help listeners. And half of it's really to help me get my head right. Um, for you, what is your educational background? And sort of how did that set up the professional work you're doing now? So I grew up in Springfield, Illinois, which is the capital of Illinois. And I am a person of some years. I will not deny that. And what it meant was that when I was in elementary school, Springfield was came under a court order to desegregate its schools, like schools everywhere in the country, uh, north and south. Um, it was uh, uh schools were completely segregated in my hometown. And as a result of that, not just the quality of the education, but particularly the conditions in which kids went to school was wildly different. And so Springfield formulated this very ambitious plan to just move kids around in order to achieve some level of racial balance. And I also have a podcast. And so I went back and um, and tried to learn more about this because I was really interested, you know, why was it that I had gone through this really kind of dramatic, uh, you know, um, geographic redistribution of kids in the interest of racial balance? And yet I didn't learn until I was an adult and moved to Boston that busing was considered controversial. And so I thought, well, you know, maybe I missed something. My parents were kind of like, they were civil rights do-gooders. So maybe there were other people marching and, you know, gnashing teeth, but it was accepted in my house. And so I went back and I did fairly extensive research. And what I discovered was that 
as in many places, these very ambitious uh, desegregation plans, um, it wasn't controversial. There was very little protest. And one thing that just stood out to me as so striking was that there was none of the sense that you see today that, you know, for one kid to do a little bit better meant that somebody else would have to give something up. Um, that the plan was motivated in large part by this real sense that kids needed to have the opportunity to develop friendships across racial lines. And so, so I grew up in what now seems to be this almost utopian uh, moment, um, but that, you know, when you think about how much the debate has changed since then. So that's a little bit about me. So, yeah. And, with with the sort of the busing issues, it's again, it's one of those things where the purpose is good. If done well, I think the function is probably fine too. But it's also, I think some of the complaints are reasonable. And, and we always have to be careful in this because I think that sometimes people are making reasonable complaints about their concern for their child or their family. I think sometimes people will find whatever excuse they can to complain because they don't like the purpose, right? Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. the outcome, the goal of greater racial equity and, and equitable education is good. But, you know, you also have the concern that of like, you know, if, if your kid's going to school on the other side of town, then their friends may live all over the town. And, you know, you, lo you lose that sense of maybe community that comes with the neighborhood school. But because housing in the United States is so very segregated, even to this day, that if you don't do some degree of busing, you know, you're never going to sort of desegregate. And so like for you, thinking back, like from the student perspective, do you feel like it was it was good for you? Like, was the education fine? Do you feel like you gave up too much, maybe in terms of the social dynamic? So it's interesting that you would ask that, because from my perspective, there was no downside that, you know, we were kids. We adapted very quickly. Riding across town on a bus to go to school to an old school was just what we did. It wasn't until I was an adult that I learned, you know, that, you know, what what that actually entailed. But as I interviewed people who went through the experience from the other side, right, who were bused from the east side of town to where I lived, I realized how much that they had had to give up. Right. And that there it was really it was, you know, like the head of the NAACP now was bust at the exact same time that I was. And it meant that she didn't have the opportunity to play junior high school sports because, you know, the transportation issue was too like there. It wasn't something that they could that her family could handle. Um, and then, you know, what I I tried to figure out, well, had busing been a success in my hometown? And as far as achieving a racial balance in the schools that reflected the demographics of the city, it was a success. But what I also discovered was tracking that I didn't really know about. So when I spoke to that, that young woman who hadn't been able to play junior high volleyball, she mentioned all of her favorite uh, teachers in high school. We went to the same high school. I never heard of any of the teachers, <laughs> right? Yeah. We weren't, we were not on the same track. And so while, you know, I experienced, uh, I definitely benefited from attending racially integrated schools. I also came away from this seeing the limits of what was achieved. And one of the limits was precisely what you just mentioned. Springfield remains a town that is incredibly segregated on the basis of, of housing and that, that just moving kids around to go to school didn't do anything about that. So when I go back and visit, Right now, when I go see my dad, the the parts of the city are just as starkly divided as they were when I was a kid. And now the debate is it's time to build a new high school and the affluent community wants the high school on their side of town. And so you can see like the limits of this bold vision really come to the fore. Yeah. And it's it's so tricky. Like even my, my wife, you know, mid 30s, she went to school in North Carolina and grew up going to the school closest to her. But her mother worked. She was uh, like the principal's secretary, basically. And so at another school on the other side of town, which her mom believed was a better school. And so when she switched schools, she ended up in you know, what is at least on paper, like a, a better school. 
but because she came from the previous school, like she brought this baggage of like, there were stereotypes of like, what were those kids like versus these kids? She avoided at least some of the stigma because her mom worked in the school. So she got to know teachers and things like that. But it's such a, it's such a weird dynamic because even if you put all the kids in the same building, those kids still go home to parents who have the same biases about where the kids come from or what they look like or whatever that may be. It could be racial or economic or, you know, whatever. And so she has like a really interesting story because this is, this was happening in the late nineties for her. And the story isn't really any different. Right. And in that case it was chosen, but it's still, I, I don't know that, I don't know that this is like the ticket to solve some of the equity issues we see in society, right? Like is school, school is a place where we have a lot of control and a lot of people are involved, but is this really the best way to address all of the inequalities? Cause like housing's at least as big an issue and changing where your kid goes to school doesn't change where they live. And so like in, in your research, both from personal experience and, and getting ready to write the book and, and doing your podcast, to what extent do you think it's fair that we frame this discussion about social equality as an educational issue? Like, are our schools really capable of addressing any of the things we think it's going to do? I think that's one of the ironies about the fact that I've sort of made this my life's interest in work is that I feel so strongly that they cannot, right? So that I, I spend a lot of my time sort of, you know, crusading against the idea that schools can fix poverty or inequality. And, and so, you know, this sort of, you know, in, in many ways, this puts me at odds with a uh, tradition of education reform that now, you know, dates back several decades. One of the things that I am most excited about as far as the Biden administration's early agenda is that instead of focusing on school reform, they're focusing on all of these very ambitious, direct ways to help families be less poor. Right. To me, that is like that is such a counter to where we've been. If you go back and you read, for example, the early speeches of Arne Duncan during Obama's first term, that, you know, the idea that you could somehow help families by giving them money was nowhere to be found there. They were still very, very much responding to the Reagan era backlash against things like welfare, but also busing for the purposes of desegregation. That, you know, the most you could hope to accomplish was to give kids the, the tools through their schools, um, measurable, to produce measurable results. And that this was why it was so important to do things like hold teachers accountable for student test scores. And that that was the sort of approach that was gonna put kids on the path to college and lift kids out of poverty that way. But the problem is that, you know, as inequality has gotten more and more profound and as the pandemic really you know, made it really hard to argue um, with a straight face that, you know, like, that uh, uh, talking about ladders of opportunity when it was so clear that the foundation had really been shaken. So yes, I, I, in my long-winded way, I am agreeing with you that too much has been heaped on the ability of schools to solve deep structural socioeconomic problems. Yeah, so I'm going to reference at least one person that we we both know now and another I'm not sure if, if you're as familiar with, but uh, I, have a, I have an episode coming up with Tina Groger, who wrote a book, and I know she was on your podcast. Let's plug the podcast, the Have You Heard podcast. Um, great irony, by the way, I make a podcast. I listen to very few. Y you are now, your, your show is now uh, in my top three in terms of number of episodes I've ever listened to. Like, I love what you guys do. And as a classroom teacher, that's really a big part of what I'm trying to do is connect, like, because sometimes teachers focus so much on what can I do in the room that we forget that that's actually like a very small piece of a very big system. And I think sometimes we disempower ourselves by not considering what influence we might have through policy, politics, or just sort of the philosophy in general. And I know for, for Tina, her book, The Education Trap, sort of argues that, that schools are not going to be the resolution to all of the other inequality uh, that, that we may find. And maybe it's a piece of it, but it alone isn't going to solve it. And I just finished, um, are you familiar with Michael Sandel? He's a philosophy professor at Harvard. Yeah, I, that his new book really, like, it blew my mind. Yes. When, I, when I read something, so the book that you and I are talking about is The, the, the Tyranny, Tyranny of, of Merit. Merit. Yeah, I just finished and it this week. I um I listened to it on I listened to the audio book first and then I I wanted I, I made my husband give it to me for Christmas too <laughs> because it was one of those where I didn't want to miss a word and I have been 
trying to force it on anyone who will listen because it pieces <laughs> together all these things that we don't normally think of as being related and you know and and that would be you know just how corrosive this idea of meritocracy has turned out to be um and so you know like i i teach podcasting at boston college and my students are very similar to the students that he describes, his Harvard students, who feel very strongly that they earned their place, right? Yeah, and, well, and it's so hard to tell them they didn't too, you know? Like exactly. I, I, I work in a, in a very affluent community, but there's actually like the poor kids are really poor, but the average kid is probably relatively wealthy anywhere else in the country, right? And, and to tell them like, to try to, to try to clarify, like I'm not saying your efforts don't matter, but I'm saying that you have so many advantages that you are so you are so many rungs up the ladder when you started that it's hard to see. And that's a hard conversation to have with someone because you don't want to discourage their work or, or lower their sort of self-worth or anything else. But it's also, I think, really important that if, if you want to have a conversation, whether it's in class or, or outside with friends or whatever, that is actually going to be productive or lead to improvement. Like that's a that's a fine line to walk. And I think you did a great job in the book. But like, how does that go with college students for you? Not very well, right? Because <laughs> you're, and it, it, it's, um, and I don't, I didn't get the sense from from listening to Sandel's book or reading it that it goes particularly well for him either, right? That this is a, this is a deeply held belief on the part of his students. And what I thought was so interesting was that he argued that that belief has really intensified over the last couple of decades. And you can totally see that. Um, and it gets back to what I was talking about originally with my experience in Springfield under desegregation, that when I went back and, and read through the archives, this sense of education as a zero sum game, of uh, education as human capital development, like I am so old that it hasn't taken hold yet, <laughs> right? Had that been the water that we swam in, you couldn't do that because parents would have felt so strongly that, you know, little Jenny would have to give something up in order for her counterpart from across town to have a shot at something better. Right. And so and so instead, what you get is this, you know, very like intense attachment to merit. And I think part of why his argument spoke so strongly to me is that I because I grew up in the Midwest, I I really have an attachment to rural America. Um, I went to college in a very small town, town of 10,000. I went to Eastern Illinois University. Oh, um, and then I went to grad school at Miami of Ohio, also in a very small town on the Ohio, Indiana border. And so when I travel around now and I visit these communities and I see the profound ambivalence that they feel towards education, that on the one hand, their schools are at the very heart of their communities. They're often the number one employers. They're the social space in which they gather. And yet they feel looked down upon by the rest of the country and by the likes of you and me. And, and so I feel like, I know we're not supposed to be talking about Sandel's book. We're supposed to be talking about my <laughs> book, yeah. but it captured all of that. Well, and I, I think I, the reason I, I mentioned it is because I think there's like this huge connection between all of this. And, and one of the things you just talked about was sort of that sense of community. I did an episode last, probably it was right around election time. There's a, a guy who is, he's becoming a friend uh, in the, I, I live in a very small rural town, the county next to where I actually teach, which is in the DC exurb. So like Loudoun County by per capita income is uh, I think the, the wealthiest county in the country by, by median household income. Like it, it's mostly new money, but there's money, right? Where I live is very different. And one of the things that, that Matt Bass is the guy I talked to that he talked about as he was running for local office was how important schools are in creating sense of community, especially in a rural place. Like there's only one high school in our whole County. Everyone goes there. Everyone goes to the football games. Like, and so the idea that you might in some way uh, shake that sort of social foundation to me is sort of concerning, but to say, steer it back towards the direction of your book, there's this sort of push for choice, which in some ways makes sense. But I think at least parts of that are based on, on what Sandel talks about with the idea of merit, that students shouldn't be going to the school that they just live closest to, or that the local government said you have to go to. There's this argument that in some ways is very reasonable. It says a kid should have the choice or family should have the choice to send them to the school that's best for the kid. You know, and if you provide some degree of, of funding, you know, through, through the government that 
it creates a sense of equity because people can choose. And then the essential argument eventually is, and then you give those kids the opportunity and everything will work itself out. The, the best kids will succeed. The worst kids won't. But at least then you can't blame it on like this local school that I was stuck in. You know, it's like you chose this, your parents chose this, and now it's up to you to do it. And there's a piece of that that resonates with me because I've grown up sort of in this meritocracy. You know, I went to school as all this was booming. And so it, to sort of connect maybe some of the ideas from your book to some of the politics you mentioned, you mentioned that a lot of this, even as far as recently as Obama's presidency, that a lot of this sort of echoes Ronald Reagan's presidency and some of his educational policies. To what extent is that what, what, what maybe once was the conservative sort of ideal of, of this meritocracy and education being a thing that can build to it and support it and grow it, you know, in, 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 in admittedly ways that were, I think, well-intended, but as the Sandel book points out, maybe have gone terribly awry for you thinking about what you've written in your book. What is the role of sort of that political piece? Like how important is Ronald Reagan's presidency still today as we think about school choice? So my co-author is an education historian, which, you know, that's not something that I would have ever thought like, oh, when I grow up, I really want to have a friend who's an education historian, right? I didn't really, <laughs> like, I, that's I, didn't the, really I want to steal that kid's lunch money. Like, what? <laughs> I, I didn't, It wasn't a thing that I even thought about, but it's been so great that, you know, like education is such a, uh, we spend so much time fighting over it and, um, and living through it and, so to be able to turn to someone and say, where did this come from has been really helpful. And one thing that really surprised me when we were working on the book is that a lot of the school choice policies that are now held up as disruptive innovations come right out of the Reagan era. And so education savings accounts, which are sweeping the country right now as the Republicans innovation, really, you know, they, they emerge in Reagan's second term and landed with a thud because at that point it was seen as, you know, it was wildly unpopular to take money out of the public school system. But I would refer you to another book. I don't know if you've had the opportunity to read Nancy McLean's book, Democracy in Chains. Uh, much of it is focused on Virginia. Okay. And so uh, there is a very, what I think of as a very eerie scene in the book. Um, Virginia has closed down many of its public schools in order to avoid having to comply with the Brown versus Board desegregation order. And at a certain point, it's economic luminaries. These are the sort of libertarian economist, James Buchanan, who would go on to win a Nobel Prize. And um, he's, you know, kind of a, an intellectual big shot in Virginia at the time. And they realized that making the case for school choice using race terms is not going to do it, that they're, you know, they're losing the public debate that way. And so they very consciously instead shift to using the language of the market. And we, you would recognize instantly all the terms that they use, the need for parent autonomy, the idea that parents are really the best suited to pick the environment that's going to be the best fit for their, their kids. The idea that if schools compete against each other, that's what's gonna drive innovation. Now, the reason that they were so keen on this is because they represent a kind of conservative libertarian philosophy that thinks that wealthy people shouldn't have to pay taxes in order to support public <laughs> education. Yeah. So that for me, that what was really useful about the writing the book was having this opportunity to trace the current debate and which is often, you know, roaring along without any context and seeing, oh, wow, here is where this started. And here's what this original group of people had in mind. I wonder if maybe we should consider that as we see states rolling out similar policies today. Yes. With, I mean, in education, we have a horribly short memory you know like with other political issues people pride themselves on being able to point to a piece of legislation or a particular politician and i actually think this is something that like one of the one of the goals of this podcast is to find ideas that people aren't talking about or in my opinion aren't talking about enough that could make education better for all students or, or most students you know whatever and one of the things that i, I keep running into is that we don't know anything about school in the past, which is why, say, having a friend who's an education historian, maybe, you know, 30 years ago sounded less appealing, but now all of a sudden seems really useful, right? Like um, I read the book, uh, what is it called? The, 
I think the teacher wars by Dana Goldstein is a really Got good it one right here. Yeah. And it, it's really good just because, and again, like that one led me to do my own research then like start looking stuff up because she did a really good job. There is a, a there's a noticeable pro teacher bias in the book. I don't think she's unfair about it, but the, you know, there, it's generally supportive of the idea of public education and teachers, but there was so much in it that I'm like, I'm a teacher. I'm a good teacher. I paid attention to my classes. I don't, I didn't know any of this stuff, you know? And it's not just that when people always say, Oh, it's like a 20 year pendulum back and forth. We don't realize that this pendulum has been swinging since at least 1900 and probably a little bit longer than that. And so, you know, the ideas of choice and, and parent autonomy, like these aren't new things. And they're also, to be honest, hard to argue against. Like, it's hard to tell someone that they shouldn't be able to make the choices about what's best for their own child. But that's also maybe not always the best way to write statewide or national policy is is that every person gets to sort of willy nilly spend the tax dollars. And so when you think about the idea that a lot of this comes back to taxes and sort of an economic freedom issue, I'm sure you know the name. I haven't got him on the podcast yet. I uh, Corey DeAngelis is sort of, of like, the, he's like the cover boy of, or, you know, the, of this kind of <laughs> yeah. stuff lately. And he and I have gone back and forth on Twitter a few times and I waited too long to invite him. He got the Forbes 30 under 30. And so now I, I got to wait him out a little bit to see if I can get him on here, but he makes really good arguments for it. My concern as a person with at least a few libertarian sympathies is that the idea of choice seems okay if you present it in one way, but I always have to remind myself the people who are arguing hardest for it are also the people who, once it's enacted, are going to turn around and go back to the arguments that we shouldn't be paying taxes for this in the first place. Mm -hmm. Like if you could present some form of school choice with guaranteed funding and take care of some equity, I mean, there, there's a bunch of problems with it, but I, I'm starting to strongly suspect that this is just a first step towards just stopping paying for education for people, you know, as, as like, as a public service. And so when you hear these great ideas about, you know, fund the families, not the institutions and these things, it's a great tagline, you know, and he uses it a lot. And I understand why my concern is that the people who pay him to do his research are also the people who are saying we shouldn't be paying those taxes in the first place. And I think a lot of the people that jump on board with the idea, like a lot of say his Twitter followers, things like that, they're paying attention to the immediate idea of I should have choice or I don't like my local school. Why can't I to get some of that tax money back to send my kids somewhere else, which maybe isn't a terrible idea. Again, there's pitfalls in it, but on its, on its face, that might be fine. Except that I think what a lot of people are missing is that the same people who are trying to make that happen are the same people who 10 or 15 or 20 years down the line are going to do everything they can to remove the funding altogether. And then what choice do you have? Because now the poor families don't have the access that we're trying to champion right now is what I'm saying reasonable. Like, I don't want to be like paranoid conspiracy theory, but I really do think that this is sort of a, a, a really sort of well-structured long-term play to eventually just sort of remove that tax burden from wealthier families. Is that a fair assessment? I think so. That's why I'm so worried about this. And I was shocked by the speed with which they're enacting these policies, something like 23 states since 2020 have proposed some version of this. And the idea is that instead of your, in, instead of uh, the state directing taxpayer funds for education to a system or a school, right? Instead, it would go directly to the parent. And I'm thinking about um, just over the border for me in New Hampshire, where they proposed a particularly sweeping version of this with almost no restrictions on where the money could go. Um, somebody pointed out during the legislative hearings that, you know, if you were a wealthy family homeschooling your kids, there was really no reason why you couldn't use these funds to pay for plane tickets to Europe. Right. And so you can see how this would open up a huge equity divide. Right. If if you all you have is the forty six hundred dollars, but I'm, you know, like swimming in it. Right. And so this is basically just a coupon for me to put towards a much more expensive education that I was planning on on paying for anyway. Right. That clearly opens up a huge divide. And then I really worry about exactly what you were just talking about. Um, Jack, my co-author's advisor at Stanford was this uh, education historian named David Labrie. Um, You should definitely check him out. And one of the things that he warned about very presciently a number of years ago was that the our shift towards thinking of public education as something that was really like the goal of it was private success, um, that it, it, 
set up the possibility, it really weakened the case for it as a public institution, right? If, if, if we measure it as far as how you, Ryan, do in your career, right? That we're, we're making it harder to argue for public education as a public good. Now take that even further. Now, instead of funding schools or systems, the money goes to you and you make a series of private choices. What, you know, how then do we justify spending taxpayer dollars for your private choices, some of which are likely to be highly objectionable to me, right? How do we make that case at all? So you can see how the little bomb has been planted in this policy, especially, at, you know, these programs have very little oversight and almost no accountability by design. And so it's very intentional that you should be able to spend the money on whatever you want. And so the more, and you can look at, at states where these are further along, like in Arizona, right? The more that the money becomes associated with fraud or for things that we don't, oh, look at Ryan, he's using his money on Xboxes, right? <laughs> right and yeah. you can see how you then, you know, you rile up people against the, the case for spending money on quote unquote education options at all. Yeah, it's almost, you know, it's poisoning the well to a certain extent. And and I've I've been thinking about this for I don't of several years, you know, cuz at where in Virginia where I teach, the only time kids take uh, standardized tests in English in high school is in 11th grade. And so that's basically all I teach. Like they give me 11 I get the high and the low. I get AP and the kids who they think aren't going to pass the state test, and that's my job. Get the AP kids to college level as fast as you can or beyond and I'm I'm very good there. And get the those other kids just make sure they pass those tests and they're going to graduate and I do that pretty well too and I don't really mess with the middle and it's just it's such a funny way that like I think even testing does this that people jumped on board with the testing because they said well look we're going to get this data that at some point will stagnate you know you're never going to hit 100 percent like that was the goal of no child left behind was eventually every kid 100 percent of kids will will pass the tests and do whatever but you're never going to if if it's a meaningful test you can't have 100 percent pass rate. Anytime 100% of people are successful on something, it wasn't really a meaningful test because what you know it was too easy to achieve the goal. But that essentially means that at some point your your data plateaus, and then you can say, look, schools aren't doing their jobs. You know, the point of the data was supposedly to make schools better, but I really think it's a way to to again poison the well. And I think that maybe the lack of oversight in some of these uh, choice programs, uh, the the savings programs, vouchers, etc. I, again, I think it's just, it looks like a long term play to undermine collective good. Now, something you said in that in that last response was you mentioned sort of the purpose of school. And it's something I like to ask people about because you pointed to how we think about schools a lot as an individual thing, you know, but, you know, as a public school teacher and someone I think a lot about community that really what we're trying to do is create healthy communities where people get along and we're functional and we have jobs because we interact with each other and, you know, all this kind of thing. For me, a school has a lot to do with community, has at least as much to do with the community as it does with the individuals who are attending the school. For you, like, what is the purpose of school? Because whether we say, hey, you have to go to this one or you're going to choose between all of them, what is it we're actually trying to accomplish in your eyes? I love your definition. And that's part of what got me into this work in the first place. So starting in 2006, I worked, I spent six years editing the statewide newspaper for the American Federation of Teachers in Massachusetts. And towards the end of my time there, the state took over a struggling school district. It's in a city called Lawrence. It's an old mill city. And um, you may have read about the Lawrence Mill Girls. And now it's an overwhelmingly Latino community, uh, mostly from uh, immigrants from the Dominican Republic. And I got very interested. I started going there and, you know, Lawrence has had a lot of problems and I started going there and talking to people. And I realized that the people who were going to be the subject of the turnaround effort, and I would, you know, put in that not just teachers and students, but the broader community, that their vision for what schools did was so much bigger than the solution being offered, because the solution being offered was intended to improve the data, right? That yeah. math and English test scores were going to go up, and here's how we're going to do it, right? That we're going to restructure some of your schools. Schools will compete against each other. And for, for people who lived in this community 
and believed in it, no matter its struggles, they thought, saw this response as just way too small. And so I could see for myself then that this was going to be a big problem, that if you're selling the solution and it's wildly out of scale with what people on the ground want, that they're never entirely going to buy in. And that, in a weird way, that was what kind of set me on my journey. And, you know, it helped me think a lot about, you know, well, what did I think schools should do? And I would say my definition is very close to yours. And that I think that they're, you know, they're the places where we're equipping students to solve many of the problems that we've created. And that's why it's so important that they do, we define them in broader terms than just places that we send kids in order to raise their math and English test scores. Yeah, and that you know, it. I had a talk with uh, I think Mike Bergen and Amy Seely, I believe they're like test prep professionals. I talked to them last summer, and they actually had really interesting ideas about how like you know everybody's down on the SATs and things like that. And their whole thing was like you know, and and they didn't deny they're like there's some good reasons for it, but they kept saying that when you say the test is the problem, the test is biased, they said that their argument, and of course they're in because, you know, their job is to prep the kids. So it's hard for them to argue against the test, but they said that in that case, really what you're doing is shooting the messenger. You're, you're mad at the SAT because look at these inequities between racial groups and economic groups. And they said, the problem isn't the test. The problem is that these kids are living in such unequal situations and going to unequal schools that the test then comes out and it, it's showing you the inequality that already existed. And they said, everybody gets mad at the test. And they're like, we love the test, not just because it's our job. We love the test because it's showing you the problems that existed beforehand. And that if you get rid of the test, you wouldn't be able to diagnose it. At the same time, maybe the solution isn't just trying to improve those test scores, right? Like there, there's probably a little bit of balance there. To what extent does that data sort of discussion factor in? Like, to and I mean in regard to choice, like, to what extent do you think that, say, some of the state testing or the college admissions testing is a factor in the way we're having the school choice debate? Like, people are you, is it ammunition to argue for choice, or am I making a connection that doesn't exist? No, the connection is absolutely there. And I really wish that Jack were here um, because one of his sort of his passion is helping people see that test scores are not an accurate or adequate way to define school quality. And so, you know, we're in a part of the country, we're in Massachusetts, where school quality and real estate values are really tightly uh, coupled. And so it means that if you're in the market for a house, it's going to cost you a lot and you're doing your search on greatschools.org and niche. And what it's going to tell you is it told him is that basically there are no good schools where he lives. Right. And so he needs, <laughs> it just blocked all, it got rid of all the schools around. He lives in a, in an urban community that's not that far outside of Boston. And because it, you know, school, uh, it, ranks school quality on the basis of test scores, which are tightly correlated to uh, race and income demographics. Basically, you are you have to move somewhere that's whiter and more affluent in order to attend a good school. Yeah, at and least so, on paper, right? At yeah. least on paper, exactly, yeah. exactly. But you can see how that, that would really exacerbate all of the worst trends that I think this model of, of uh, melding school choice and accountability is supposed to help us sort of move beyond. Um, but I think you know what you what you see in communities where this vision is the most advanced. And I would I would go to a city like Denver, for example, that putting a market structure on top of inequity ends up exacerbating the inequity because you reward the people who have the most social capital and the most ability to do the school shopping. Um, if you listen to the podcast, Nice White Parents, I know you don't listen to that many podcasts. I, I actually, but, I did listen to the first, I think two episodes, a, co a coworker uh, hounded me for weeks like you had. So I think I listened to the first two, like one and a half, but yeah, it, same, same thing, right? It, Yes, in that first episode, she really paints such a vivid picture of school shopping and process. And you know that you have these parents who go from school to school, they're doing all the tours, they're peppering the, the school leaders with questions. You know, they're very focused on school performance and the data. And you could just see how, how this would end up exacerbating disparities that existed prior to that. 
So, yes. Yeah, so I, I feel like the, um, I understand why people are so insistent that we need accountability in order to hold people's feet to the fire. Um, but I think in many ways, the, the, it's unintended consequences have been to, to widen divides. Yeah. I, I've been arguing for a while that if we're really serious about thinking about the real purpose of what a school's supposed to do, we would measure the quality of a school, not by the kids test scores when they're 10 or 12 or 17, we would check in with the general quality of life in the community over time. And we would check in with those individual students when they're 30 and they're 40 and they're 50. Are you alive? Are you healthy? Do you have a job? Are you reasonably ha happy with your family? Like the, we make, all of these very big long-term and expensive decisions based on very narrow short-term data. And, and so I, I think that in the end, everything gets skewed because the kid who looks like a good student on paper maybe isn't going to do the things that we're hoping in a community over time. And it, and, and I understand it's hard to measure the things I just asked for, but at the same time, you know, education is expensive. Like we put a lot of money into this. And if people say they're serious about getting the right data to make the right decisions, then I don't think it's crazy to ask for a more long-term assessment of what happens in a community or to the individuals from a certain school over time, because, you know, I can bump a kid's test scores in two weeks. Like, you know, I'm not saying I can take kid who can't read and make, but give me a kid who failed by 30 and I'll get him to pass by 50. If you give me two hours, one-on-one, -on -one. like it's not a crazy thing to, to, manipulate that test a little bit. And so I think that sometimes we're, we're sort of missing the bigger picture and what we're trying to do. As we think about one of maybe the big, the big sort of arguments about school choice, both historically and now, is how this factors in not just for poor students, but let's say specifically for Black and Hispanic students. And one of the things that I found really interesting and on a very sort of amateur look at this, like you're, you're the person that can speak to this because you have far better research than I do, but I'm seeing it looks like a growing support for the concept of school choice in black and brown communities, because I think people feel like they keep looking at this data that says, well, my kid's behind or this, this certain group is behind. And so it looks to me like, and it might be a slow shift, but I'm seeing a lot of black parents and educators who are starting to warm to the idea of school choice because everyone keeps saying your kid isn't doing well in this public school or your kid isn't being served well. Like that's the narrative. And it looks like people are starting to think that school choice might be a resolution to some of the racial inequality. Even those you pointed out, if you go back into the sixties and early seventies, school choice was being presented as a way to avoid the equality and the desegregation. Again, small sample size for me. Is that something that you guys have seen? Like, how does the idea of racial equality factor into school choice? I think you're absolutely right. And so this is not a new thing, right? So like, if you go back and you look at the early school choice programs in places like Milwaukee and, and Washington, D.C., they were, you know, they were specifically designed in order to benefit kids in those communities, right? And the idea was that, that you know, their parents didn't have the privilege of, of being able to vote with their feet the way that maybe you know, Wisconsin parents who moved to the suburbs had. And then what I think is really interesting is that over time, you start to see politics come into play again, right? And that is that, you know, income limits, which are originally part of the program in order to make sure that it goes to benefit um, a specific group of kids. Well, those slowly get removed or eliminated altogether. And so what you see over time is that the, the kids who are part of the program, um, you know, it starts to attract more and more white students. It starts to attract more and more wealthy students. So in, in Indiana, for example, the, uh, their legislators there are proposing a vast expansion of the voucher program. And, you know, uh, the income limit is being raised to $150,000. I don't know if you know anything about Indiana, but I'm guessing rural Virginia is similar, right? That that's a fortune, yeah, right? You're, so you're we doing have, pretty well in Indiana with 100, you know, yeah, 150,000. So we have to ask again, right, who, you know, who is it that these programs are intended to benefit? And that, you know, in some ways we're you and I are having a conversation about something that is kind of over, right? The days of school choice programs being crafted to benefit 
poor, you know, kids who are, who are trapped in quote unquote failing schools. Like now we're the, the next iteration of these programs is to make them universal. That's really the, that's considered the gold standard. So if you listen to, for example, to a Corey DeAngelis talking about, you know, uh, what these programs should look like, they should be for all kids. Yeah. And, um, and I, and again, I think that that's it's sort of the slippery slope where all of this goes. You start with one thing, and and we may end up with something else. There, there's a little bit of a bait and switch in the long term, and that's my sort of big hesitation. Because again, on the, on the plain idea, should a parent be able to have some choice? Sure. Can we find a way so that poor families can make the same choices that rich families get to make? Like that sounds great too. But <laughs> when you actually look at the details of the policies and think about how this can play out over the long term. I don't know that anybody, I don't know that I've seen anyone proposing a school choice program that has anything near the regulations or restrictions that would be necessary to ensure the long-term outcome. Like, I still don't think that this is an impossibility. Like, I think there's, there are ways that you could do school choice that could achieve those goals and not necessarily undermine whole communities. I just don't see anybody proposing choice with any of the kind of restrictions or, or sort of the nuance that might lead to that. It's just, you're going to end up, everybody points to, um, was it, I think it's Milwaukee. I looked at the data for, and for like poor students and black students who see the, the greatest successes when they have school choice, it's because they end up going to schools that admit very few voucher students and they're predominantly white schools. So you can hold up these, these handful of kids who like, look at this great outcome. But what happens when you have, you know, poor kids, black or brown kids who go to a, who choose and then go to a predominantly black or brown school, or they go to a place where they're letting in tons of kids on the public vouchers, there's essentially no difference to public education. Like the, the data just doesn't bear out that there's a big enough difference on the large scale. And so again, that, that sort of has, that's where my concerns pop up is as an idea, this could work, but I, I don't know that that's going to happen. You said that, you know, maybe we're having a conversation about something that has already gone by. To what extent do you think that that's going to bear out long-term results? Like, do you, do you think that this one year, year and a half, whatever blip of kids say going to school from home or whatever it may be and parents being upset, do you think that that's really going to have long-term impacts on the way we, on the way this bears out? Yes, um, for a couple of different reasons. One, that there there really is going to be a substantial shift in terms of the percentage of parents who are who who they for one reason or another they found online learning preferable for their kids. You know that was mm-hmm. a real wake up call, right? That like for um for there were a lot of parents of color who felt like this was a way to make sure that their kids stayed safe. They they noticed that their you know their kids were noticeably uh, more relaxed, right? Less fearful about going to school. I just interviewed 15 students from uh, six different high schools in Boston, middle and high schools. And it was so interesting how even though they acknowledged all of the shortcomings of remote learning, and you can really hear them, right? Like their audio was terrible. <laughs> there were little kids, you know, like little kids bursting into the scene or screaming in the background. Yeah, there's all the, <laughs> so much uh, almost, going on. Almost all of them could point to something that was better about remote learning or something they'd learned about themselves in the process. And I feel like that's really been missing from the adult conversation of the debate. So definitely look for that to play an expanded role. Smart schools, school districts will act on that by offering that as, a, as an option, because what's more likely to happen is that you have, in these states I mentioned before, where Republicans made big gains in 2020, they are chomping at the bit to expand for-profit online options. When you were talking about the like kids ending up in schools that are heavily dependent on vouchers, just as segregated as public schools, to me, what's worse about that situation is one, how much advertising is involved, that you have companies really preying on parents and saying, you know, here, this is all you need. All you need is ABC mouse, right? And, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. and, and so I think that the, the pandemic exposed a lot of vulnerability, but it also left people more vulnerable. And because of what's happening politically in a lot of these states, 
you are going to see public education destabilized in in a way that's very worrisome. Yeah, and and that that's actually been a big concern of mine since I literally since I started the podcast. I think it was the third or fourth episode, and and I had a good talk with a coworker who has some interesting ideas about choice and flexibility in schools and things like that. And and he's very much of the you know just just scrap it or you know go to full choice whatever. And and again, I, I understand you know some of his arguments, but I, I keep trying to remind people in this discussion is that no matter what we do we should sort of like slow roll it, which is something that schools are very good at. Schools you know, do not change rapidly, much to my frustration. Like, I, I think there's a lot of cool things we could do. We should just do them. Um, but for, for policy level decisions, like if we undermine the funding or the structure of it, it takes a long time to build up you know, a public school system. I just, it literally just the real estate it takes to have the buildings and to do all that sort of stuff. And so if we make decisions that damage it, it could take a very long time to get things back if you ever could. And so for all the states that are sort of rushing and, and people who are jumping on board with these ideas, again, I'm not saying they're automatically wrong, but this is one of those things that we should be slow about. Like we should be faster in how we update methods in the classroom or curriculum or whatever. We should be a little slower on how we handle some of these policy pieces, because I think we're making rash decisions in response to an immediate issue in the last year that is going to bear out for generations if we're not very careful about either either avoiding it or implementing it maybe more carefully than we're doing, you know, and, and I don't I don't know that that's happening. Say with with the online sort of option. Uh, I think I agree. I think a lot of places are going to continue to offer online. I think there's going to be an expansion of that, at least in places that can afford it. But that raises the question of, say, choice within a public system. So when we think about school choice, how do how do you think of the idea of, say, like public charters and things like that? Like personally, and by the way, that's that's my bias. That's where I am. I wish we could create a public system that created choice between schools that were more specialized. You know, I, I work in a county that has 17 schools and they all do the same thing. Why, maybe we could just have a handful of them specialize in certain areas and allow for choice within that system, within that local community. You don't undermine the community. It doesn't upset the funding. Students still get to go to a place that does what they want it to do. Like, I think there's a way to do that, but I don't hear a lot of people pushing for that with the idea of offering online choices within a public school or thinking about public charters. Is there a a route to that outcome? Like, is it possible to make the parents or community members who want choice happy and not make them do it outside of a public system? Or am I being overly optimistic? I think you're being overly optimistic <laughs> for a different, a different reason that you brought up. So, you know, one, one of the challenges that, that we're going to face is that the idea of having sort of multiple school systems functioning, you know, like uh, I'm, I'm thinking about places where the charter sector is now uh, close to being as big as the public school system or, or bigger, right? And that one of the assumptions built into that is that there will always be enough students and always be enough funds. And so when you go to a place like Denver, where suddenly they're looking at, you know, the population has just stopped growing. All of the people moving in are people without kids. And so you're left with this this great idea of publicly managed choice where you have a whole bunch of different schools that are organized around different themes and you know and and parents get to pick which theme they want and they really like picking that theme well now you know now we're at a point where there are fewer students so which theme school is going to get it right right? and so empty classrooms yeah got empty classes. So somebody has to pay that price. And right now, the um, those decisions are made on the basis of test scores. And so if you look at what's happened in Denver over the past 10, 15 years, the schools that have shut down have all been in the African American community. And so they've, you know, it's created this big backlash because the benefits of choice have not been distributed equally. And the pain of choice has fallen disproportionately on one community. And so now they're going back and they're trying to think about like, well, how, you know, how is there a way to to do all of this? Right. Is there is there a way to give people more options that doesn't end up accidentally taking options away from um, from people who, frankly, have always had the fewest options? Yeah. And, and, you know, and I'm, I'm glad you pointed that out. That's actually, that's, that's good for me because where I work is uh, again, it's a wealthy community. It's a quickly growing community, right? There's big population growth. People on average make a lot of money. 
And so what I'm suggesting would probably work, at least in the short term, where I, where I work, like in my bubble, I, and again, I, I, I still like the idea, but you're right. As you try to expand that out to say like rural communities where you don't have as many school buildings mm-hmm. or you don't have, have the population to support it, like th- there could be trouble there. I just, I always sort of think like there's got to be a middle ground where you don't have to throw away your public system but we could also allow a little more flexibility. Like kids, kids don't all need to take, you know, four math classes and, you know, the same history classes or read all the same books. Like we can, we can be more flexible. And so I keep thinking like, what's the way to do that, but maybe do that on a school level, not just like class to class sort of level, but yeah, I'll, I'll have to, I'll look up the Denver piece. So, all right. I, I've can got, I ask you, to, can I ask yeah, you a question about absolutely, that? Absolutely. Yeah. So um, I, I think where I struggle is how do you, how do you align what's kind of an individualist vision of, uh, around schools and, you know, and what, you know, like how, how individual kids, you know, like how, how we should offer education to individual kids versus this community vision that you had. And I just wondered if you've thought about that at all. Like, yeah, like- I, I think that everybody should like literacy and numeracy are the skills, you know, not just for test scores. Like if you can manipulate numbers, you can read and write and speak well, you know, like you will end up being a functional person. Like Mm -hmm. those are the, those are the basic things that we need. And so for me, I think that all schools should sort of focus in on that and then allow a little bit more specialization for the individual, because what we're trying to do is support a community, which has people, you know, go to school together, attend the same sports events, you know, whatever that may be. Um, but say even, you know, sort of take an old school vision, you still need someone who's going to fix the road, someone who's going to make mm-hmm. the shoes, someone who's going to run the library. Like, so the idea that everyone has to get the same education until they're 18 years old doesn't actually support a healthy community where people are going to need to do different jobs. And right now we have the idea that you get out of school and you're going to go to college to specialize or you'll go get a job and learn it there. I just think we can start that earlier and it doesn't have to start mm-hmm. in kindergarten, but you know, by the time a kid's 12, 13, 14, 15, somewhere in there, most people have a sense of the direction they want to lean. And unfortunately we go to schools that don't allow a lot of that, that leaning, you know? And, and so that's sort of my thought on it is that, that you can start it somewhere in there. And it would also take some of the pressure off of college that if you could do some of your, your specialized learning beforehand, mm-hmm. um, that might be one way to take away some of the stress and the the cost and the rest that we have with college. But you're, you're right. If, if you don't do it carefully, you can sort of undermine the community vision that I talked about earlier. Uh, I just, I just think that we can support a community by giving people the training they need to work in the community. And we don't have to wait until after they're 18 to start doing it. You know, so the, like, one, the, only, the only thing that, makes me a little bit nervous about that when I was talking about my experience going to Lawrence and and talking to people about their vision of of school reform it was the first place where I'd ever encountered um kind of career academies within a high school and I just have to say that you know like in a a lot of ways it met exactly the definition of what you're talking about but on the other hand I was really disturbed at how these kids were being tracked into yeah, what seemed like yeah. very, you know, like a healthcare academy. So if we went, um, I, I live in a part of um, Massachusetts that uh, it's an old fishing community. And so, um, you know, in not that long ago, something like a third of the kids in high school were expected to go right onto their, a, a boat, yeah. right? And so there was very little expectation that schools really needed to do anything, but I'm surrounded on both sides by very affluent communities where kids are groomed to believe from, you know, their youngest age that, you know, the world is theirs to dominate. And I think that's such a big part of the kind of, you know, the vision and, you know, what, what it is we expect schools to do that there are so many of these baked in kind of, well, you know what I mean? Yeah. These assumptions. And and Mm -hmm. it's also tricky too, because, you know, I've run into this where I live. Like one of the reasons that I was okay moving here because people love the elementary school, the high school gets sort of mixed reviews. Like some kids go into great colleges, Mm -hmm. but you know, test scores are a little mixed and things like that. And my general belief was I'm a teacher. I'm a bright person. We'll read with the kids a lot. Like I'm not, I'm not deterred by the quality of the school because I don't think it's a bad school. I just think that people have very different goals, but there are some, you know, the, it's an agricultural community. There are a lot of people who have actually made out loud in public, the argument that we don't want our school to be too good because all these kids are going to leave and go to college and they're never coming back. And in, in a, in an immediate time, it's a valid concern, you know, but at that same time, I don't think that 
the community you grow up in should should sort of hamstring you in that way. <laughs> so, um, yeah. you know, I, I, I don't know. But yeah, you're, you're right. Like, you know, if, if you provide the choice, you have to be very careful about not tracking the kids or force them into it, which really means, again, that then the parents have to be informed about the choices they have. And, you know, it, it, all of all of it could be messy. But I think, again, if we're careful and slow in in the rollout, if we're not too strict in the policy piece, you can allow the flexibility to say, okay, what we're doing needs adjusted and to keep adjusting. You know, I, I think that a lot of, a lot of things we do in school, we write a policy because we think it's a good idea, but we corner ourselves and, and we just don't have the flexibility to adapt or say, this isn't working. Let's adjust unless we get like national legislation. Like so, some of these things I think could be done more carefully locally. Um, but again, then you have, you know, the whole concern about how much do we trust the local school board and the rest. Um, so here, I know, I know you have some stuff to get to. So I, I, I could ask you 500 more questions, but I don't want to take up your whole afternoon. Uh, so I have two that I ask everyone and, and I may, I may send you an email with one or two follow-ups just cause I'm curious, not, not for podcast purposes, but the two questions that I, I usually get to by the end of the podcast with everyone, I'm curious what you'll say here is one, if you were given a school to run, like you just, you have a building and a budget, to you, what would be the ideal school? Like how how similar or different is that from what we do now? And then we'll wrap up real quick with a couple book and movie recommendations. We'll get you out of here. So my um, ideal school would be one that was really organized around equipping kids with the ability to solve some community problem. Um, and so, you know, I'm thinking about the place where I live, which is Gloucester, Massachusetts, where we went from having a vibrant fishing industry to basically having none today. And so we're left with this big problem of what, you know, what is the community then? And I, I think that, you know, like in many ways, the because the school has to do all these other things we've been complaining about, right, that they're under a lot of pressure to produce math and English test scores that meet the state's definition of proficiency. And so it shoehorns not just the kids, but the community into this definition of what a school should be. So that's, if it were up to me, um, that's what that's what we would be doing. And in fact, um, somebody here did start a school. It's a post-secondary school for kids who graduated from high school, but then did not go on to college. And now they're learning to do careers in marine sciences, which I think is just amazing. And I think there's so much room out there for, for other things like that. Yeah. That, and, and if you want the kids to stick around, then let them shape the community that they're going to live in. Yes. You know, like let them have a voice in that. And then maybe they're more inclined to stay and invest in that community rather than run out as quick as they can. And know? acknowledge the real, like the legitimate fear and ambivalence on the part of adults in the community that, you know, educating kids for college means that they'll leave and never come back. Yeah. Like, we view that as a reason to look down on them like oh look at them they don't believe in college but that you know like that to me that just feels so heartbreaking yeah they're, they're trying to defend their home and a way of life and and that those aren't unreasonable things to do um but again i think you know that's where we have to be very careful about redirecting the conversation to what's best for those young people and then for the community as a whole and less education probably isn't the answer but maybe different education could be or you know handling it differently um all right so last question of course we are recommending a wolf at the schoolhouse door the dismantling of public education and the future of school but what other books or movies just a couple it could be for fun it could relate to this mm -hmm. topic anything at all sort of the wild card question of the podcast what are some things that you think listeners should read or watch heather mcgee's new book the sum of us um, it's about how racial resentment has poisoned America. It, she starts with this incredible metaphor that isn't actually a metaphor because it's real. And those would be the huge number of beautiful public pools that were constructed throughout the U.S. in the 20s and 30s. And that once desegregation orders came down, many communities chose to just get rid of them, fill them with dirt, let them, you know, fall into ruin just so they wouldn't have to share them. And I thought, what an amazing uh, way to think about what's happened in public education. Um, as far as movies, fortunately, for your listeners' sake, I I can't think of any education-related movies that I've been <laughs> watching. Um, the, um, I watched two documentaries recently that just blew my mind. Um, one was My Teacher, the Octopus, about a guy in South Africa who is sort of, you know, he's going through a rough time and he seeks solace in the water off the coast near his house and he encounters an octopus and over the course of a year we learn all about 
you know what the life of an octopus is like it's really amazing cool that's yeah on that's on netflix um and i just saw um an amazing documentary about the retirement community in florida known as the villages Mm-hmm. um it's called some kind of heaven really recommend that I had I'd heard of the place and my brother-in-law he he's great he sends me like just I get like 10 links a day from him and whatever I catch up that's it and he sent me like three on one day like two weeks ago he sent me three articles about that place and I read it and I was like I can't decide if this is the greatest place to retire or the scariest place in the world but I don't think it's in the middle like I think it's probably one of the two and I don't I don't know so I, I will probably watch that one tonight just because now I'm really curious so all right, we'll, we'll wrap up. Uh, th- we've been talking with Jennifer Berkshire, the co-author of A Wolf at the Schoolhouse Door, The Dismantling of Public Education and the Future of School. She's also the co-host of, uh, you know what, let's give you the credit. I- I've been listening. You're doing more work on that podcast. She's the host of the Have You Heard podcast, uh, which deals with all kinds of great sort of education and policy issues. It- it's It's been fantastic. So uh, this has been the ClassCast podcast. I'm your host, Ryan Tibbins. You can find the ClassCast podcast at www.classcastpodcast.com on YouTube and on all major streaming services. Jennifer, thank you very much for taking the time to speak today. Thank you for having me and for acknowledging that that podcast really is the product of my creative labor. I've, I, you know, the, the, the book, I've only read excerpts. I can't say there, but I've listened to enough of the podcast now. You, you're getting the credit for that one. So, <laughs> all right. Well, everybody have a great day. Thanks, Ryan. 